As a primary school teacher, my weekly routine is quite structured, with set working hours and staff meetings every Tuesday afternoon, usually wrapping up around 6 o'clock p.m., which means I typically get home by 7 o'clock p.m. My wife, Terry, whom I've been married to for 31 years, often returns home exhausted from her gym sessions on these evenings. Consequently, I usually take it upon myself to prepare dinner while she unwinds with a shower and handles other household tasks. Unexpectedly, one day, our school principal announced the cancellation of the staff meeting while it was still early around 3.30 p.m. Seizing the moment, I decided to head home early, planning to surprise Terry with a candlelit dinner and hopefully a peaceful evening that could perhaps spark a renewal of our intimacy and connection. Our marriage had been experiencing some strains, primarily over financial matters, and I had noticed Terry growing increasingly distant and assertive over various aspects of our life, often leading to stubborn disagreements. Upon arriving home, a scenario I had meticulously planned in my mind, I parked in our garage, strategically placed a good distance from the house to ensure minimal disturbance to our children's sleep when they were younger. Their uninterrupted rest was crucial not just for their well-being but for our peace of mind as well, allowing us some quiet time to recharge. Today, as I walked from the garage to our house, I noticed Terry's car was already there, a usual sight on her gym days since she preferred taking the bus. Entering through the back door, my first intention was to tidy up the space. I pride myself on keeping our home well-maintained, ensuring that all the door hinges and moving parts were silent and efficient. We both disliked any form of noise from them. However, the first anomaly that struck me was seeing Terry's handbag abandoned on the kitchen counter. She was usually meticulous about keeping it close, no matter which part of the house she was in. This out-of-place item shifted my attention, and I soon noticed her gym attire, a snug leotard and a large towel, discarded on the floor nearby the counter. Then, the sound of movement from our bedroom upstairs caught my ear. Considering Terry might have returned unwell, I cautiously made my way up the carpeted stairs nearly stumbling over a pair of men's shoes that were certainly not mine. As I continued, I found more clothing scattered along the steps. A shirt, pants, tank top, socks, and notably, Terry's lingerie, reserved solely for special occasions like our anniversaries. I froze, feeling my skin turn clammy as my heart skipped a beat and my blood pressure dropped sharply. Overwhelmed, I had to sit down on the stairs to regain my composure. My usual calm and control and from years of managing classrooms full of children, suddenly abandoned me. An unfamiliar surge of adrenaline coursed through me, igniting a fury I had never known. Having never been involved in a physical altercation, these feelings were entirely alien to me. Driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, I cautiously continued up the stairs to our shared closet, which has two doors, one leading to the bedroom and another to the upstairs bathroom. To reach the bedroom, I needed to pass through the ensuite bathroom, which connected to our spacious walk-in closet, and then to our bedroom. As I approached the wardrobe door leading to the bedroom, I could see through the slightly open door, a sight that seemed to be straight out of a horror film, impossible to look away from. The sounds of moans and grunts that I had been hearing were now crystal clear, and my heart was filled with an overwhelming mix of anger and disbelief. I pulled out my phone and began recording the scene before me, knowing I would need this footage later not only to confront Terry, but to confirm to myself that this was not some horrible nightmare. This evidence was crucial for the inevitable confrontation. I stood frozen, witnessing the harrowing spectacle of betrayal unfolding before me. This was my wife, my lover, my life partner, the woman I had entrusted with my deepest confidences. She was the mother of our grown children, a woman in her 40s who was active in charity work and always professed her love for me above all else. Yet here she was, committing an act of betrayal in its most raw and painful form. Unable to bear it any longer, I stopped recording and quietly descended the stairs. Leaving our property, I began walking aimlessly, eventually finding myself in a park miles away from home. There, I splashed water on my face, sat down and watched the recording on my phone, turning the volume down to avoid drawing attention from nearby children. On that small screen, I saw the destruction of my life, and everything I had cherished as normal, captured in stark digital reality. It was the wreckage of our marriage, and it was at this moment, sitting alone in the park, that I finally allowed myself to break down and cry. It was around 7 o'clock p.m., the time I usually return home on days when we have staff meetings. However, 
This evening was different as I stood at our back door, visibly distressed. Terry immediately sensed something was amiss. My unkempt look, red eyes, and pale complexion did little to hide my state. With evident concern, she asked, Honey, what's wrong? You look really pale. Is everything okay? Let me get you a drink. Are you all right? Her eyes were filled with genuine worry. I found myself unable to disclose the true cause of my distress. With a shaky voice, I managed to say, Not really. Something I ate at lunch upset my stomach. I think I'll take a shower and head to bed. Terry responded, Okay, hun, but maybe take a container with you to bed, just in case you need to throw up. We wouldn't want it on the clean sheets. Those sheets, once a symbol of cleanliness, were now tainted in my mind by a stain far more insidious than any physical mess. Betrayal. Firmly, I replied, It's okay, I'll sleep in the spare room until I feel better and I made my way to the downstairs bedroom. For the next few days, I continued this routine, distancing myself under the pretense of illness while Terry carried on as usual, seemingly oblivious to the undercurrents of my discomfort. I was merely functioning on autopilot at work and home, and kept sleeping in the spare bedroom. However, I knew I couldn't maintain this ruse indefinitely. Eventually, I moved back into our main bedroom, but sleeping there, in that place tarnished by betrayal, was agonizing. Terry acted as if nothing had changed. By the time Monday rolled around, I had decided on my next steps. I needed to determine if this was a one-time incident or an ongoing affair. I informed my principal that I would need to undergo an unexpected medical procedure the next day, and he arranged for a substitute teacher to cover my classes. Tuesday morning, I left home as usual, but parked a few streets away from our neighborhood. I walked back discreetly, familiar with the rear entrances to the neighboring yards near our house. With utmost caution to avoid being seen, I made my way to our garage at the back of the property, where I changed into casual attire and soft, noiseless socks, ideal for moving silently. It then became a waiting game. Recalling that there was no extra car at home when I had unexpectedly returned early the previous Tuesday, I realized I couldn't rely on the sound of a car to alert me to any visitors. They must have walked. I stealthily navigated our gardens until I reached a spot where I could observe our front door while remaining concealed by the hedges and bushes we had strategically planted for privacy from the road. As I waited, Terry could be heard going about her usual tasks, completely unaware of my presence. Her confidence that everything was proceeding as normal was clear. She moved through her kitchen duties, operating the dishwasher and cleaning up, then transitioned to household chores in the living room like vacuuming and dusting. This routine continued until about 11.30 when Terry headed upstairs. I could faintly hear the shower running, followed by a period of quiet and then the sound of the toilet flushing. She returned downstairs about 45 minutes later and opened the front door, leaving it slightly ajar, a clear invitation for someone expected. I didn't have to wait much longer. At around 12.30, he arrived. I didn't recognize him, but he approached from the left side of our front gate. My phone captured about 10 seconds of video providing side profiles and even an almost direct view of his face. He entered without hesitation and proceeded through the door. The next words I heard sent shivers down my spine. Hey lover, I hope you're dressed for a big workout again. Terry's response was flirtatious, of course. You always love it when I wear these. I sometimes wonder if it was these that attracted you to me in the first place, or maybe it was these. Having seen enough to confirm the ongoing affair, their familiarity suggested it wasn't just a one-off encounter. As they moved toward the bedroom, I retreated to the garage, trying to compose myself while my heart pounded uncontrollably. I grappled with burning questions. Who was this man? Why was this happening? How would I confront Terry? Everything seemed suddenly chaotic. I realized then that I couldn't love my wife, Terry, after her betrayal. I doubted any future intimate connection with her particularly as I saw no signs of protection, which raised concerns about potential health risks if she was also intimate with others. I pondered why she never discussed her feelings openly with me. Recalling Terry's two-year routine of gym sessions, where she also engaged with local married women and participated in charity events, I wondered if perhaps the gym held some answers to our marital issues. Being a teacher, I had access to a variety of resources including computers and printers at school. I decided to start my investigation by printing out profile pictures from the footage on my phone, hoping to identify those involved and possibly trace the connections to the origin of the affair. 
It wasn't long before I made my first move, accompanying Terry to her regular gym session. Terry resisted the idea, offering weak excuses such as, it's just a group of married ladies, and we mostly chat during the session. Despite her reluctance, I persisted and joined her at the gym the following Thursday. Walking into the gym felt like stepping into an old western movie scene where the newcomer gets all the stares. As I entered, I could feel all eyes on me, accompanied by whispers among the ladies. Terry dismissed their reactions by saying they were not used to seeing her accompanied during her sessions. The workout began with standard warm UPS and stretching, followed by rotations between various exercise stations designed to target different muscle groups. About 45 minutes in, I had to take a break as my blood sugar started dropping. After consuming some jelly beans and resting for a bit, I returned my focus to Terry. It was clear she was quite nervous, frequently glancing toward the staff area where the instructors typically entered the main hall. During my break, I decided to explore the gym a bit more. I came across a wall near the hall exit that displayed staff information. It seemed a good distraction while I waited for Terry. The top photo on the wall was of a woman labeled as Miss Elizabeth W's, the director and owner of the gym, her age indeterminable but in great shape. Below her photo were her contact details and hours of availability. As I scanned the other photos, I stopped abruptly when I recognized one of the individuals. It was him, the man from my footage, involved with Terry. His photo identified him as Mr. Philip Boney, the head of exercise regime planning and personal body training. As I memorized his phone number, I realized Terry had left the station where she had been working out. After searching the gym, I finally spotted Terry engaged in what appeared to be an urgent conversation with a man by some powerlifting equipment near the staff-only area. It seemed she was preventing him from entering further. After a brief exchange, she gestured emphatically for him to leave and quickly return to her station. This unexpected visit to the gym had provided me with critical insights and confirmed the ongoing nature of Terry's affair, further complicating my feelings and the decisions I faced about our future. Unbeknownst to Terry, I had witnessed her secretive conversation and was grappling with an unfamiliar intensity of anger. When she returned to where I was sitting, her immediate concern was evident. Are you okay? Did it take a while for your blood sugar to recover? She inquired. Yeah, I'm fine now. Are you ready to go? I responded, eager to leave. Before she could answer, an announcement over the gym's PAW system interrupted us. Miss W has informed everyone that Mr. Bounty's usual closing exercise session was canceled as he had suddenly fallen ill. This news was met with disappointment from many of the women, indicating Mr. Bounty's sessions were a much anticipated part of their routine. This requires investigation, I thought to myself, noting Terry's silent relief at the announcement. As we prepared to leave, Terry quickly collected her towel and handbag, signaling her readiness to exit swiftly. Just then, one of the women, whom I hadn't initially recognized, approached Terry. It's such a shame that Phil couldn't finish the session as usual tonight, she commented. Terry responded simply, true, and quickly headed for the car, dismissing further conversation with a curt okay. See you. Terry entered the car more quickly than usual, and the ride home was unusually quiet. She appeared relaxed, with her head tilted back and her eyes closed, taking deliberately slow breaths. This change in her demeanor was not lost on me, and I decided to probe a little deeper. So that was quite an interesting session, dear, I remarked casually. The workout station seemed really well set up. No wonder you're looking so fit and trim. Thanks, honey, she replied. They offer an extensive program, and I enjoy going there. The ladies are friendly, too. It's just a shame about Mr. Bounty. You mean Bounty, she corrected quickly, a bit too hastily. Phil, I mean, Philip Boney. He usually wraps up every session with an exercise routine that really challenges everyone. It was disappointing that he wasn't there tonight. Internally, I scoffed at her commitment to this facade. I knew exactly how Mr. Boney was pushing her body, but all I said was, maybe next Thursday he'll be feeling better. As the week progressed, I contemplated the next encounter between Terry and Mr. Boney. My role at school that week involved pickup duty an often chaotic time when teachers oversee the area where parents pick up their children by car after school. Amid the hustle and bustle of children eagerly chatting and searching for their parents, I planned my next steps to uncover the full extent of Terry's betrayal. At the end of pickup time, 
parents are typically adjusting to the ebb and flow of the car queue, hoping for a smooth handoff of their child. Unexpectedly, a car pulled up, driven by the woman who had tried to converse with Terry at the gym the night before. Hi, she greeted me warmly. I'm sorry, but I'm new to this whole pickup thing, and I completely lost track of time. Is my son Timothy here? As teachers, we're accustomed to such situations, especially with newcomers to the school. I reassured her, don't worry, I'll go find Timothy for you, while my colleague continued to supervise the remaining children. I found Timothy chatting near his classroom with another staff member's child. Hey Tim, I called out, your mom's here to pick you up, come with me to the pickup area. He looked somewhat confused by this, considering he was in the last year of primary school, and not one to easily forget such details. That's odd, he commented. Mom is usually busy with her gym instructor on Friday afternoons. At my previous school, she sometimes didn't arrive until around 5.30. The mention of a gym instructor intensified my suspicions. Maintaining composure, I casually remarked, Ah, it's good to see your mom taking care of her health. Exercise is an important part of staying healthy. Do you know the instructor's name? I braced myself for his answer. Oh, his name is Bounty, or something like that, Timothy replied. He also works at a local gym and gives private lessons at people's homes. That's what I want to do when I grow up. Mom really enjoys her workouts with him on Friday evenings. She's so relaxed and looks radiant by the time we get home. Fridays are always takeout nights because Mom rarely has time to cook. No way, I thought to myself. This Bonte guy is involved with more people than just my wife. I walked Timothy back to his car where his mother expressed her gratitude for our concern. No problem, I replied. It's all part of the service. By the way, I don't believe we've met before. I'm Gerard D.S. The kids call me Mr. D for short. Nice to meet you. I shook her hand. Hi, I'm Mary Jones. I remember seeing you at the gym last Thursday. I was there with my wife, Terry. Sorry, she seemed rushed when leaving. Mr. Bont's absence seemed to disrupt everyone's routine that night, she said. At that moment, her entire demeanor changed dramatically. Previously apologetic and casual, she suddenly turned pale and guarded. She appeared almost trembling as she said, Um, yes, all right. I'll see you again, Mr. Diaz. Goodbye. She quickly drove off, leaving a lingering sense of unease. It was time to rethink my future, a plan I once believed was securely crafted alongside Terry. Now this future looks starkly different, involving only me, and certainly not Terry. Driven by my anger, I found myself venturing down a path I had never previously considered, the path of retribution. I began to meticulously pore over all the minute yet significant details of our shared daily life. Questions like who manages the bills, which insurance company we use, when our utility bills are due, and from which account these expenses are paid became my focus. As I cataloged this information, I realized that our mortgage was nearly paid off and my superannuation account had impressively grown to $900. Zero, thanks to our teachers' union which had made compulsory super contributions a staple of our employment conditions. After conducting extensive online research without Terry's knowledge, I reluctantly accepted that an even division of all our assets was inevitable. Our children were now financially independent, and we had about $30,000 saved in a cash account for a planned overseas trip that would no longer take place. My first action was to deplete that account as quickly as possible before Terry could discover my awareness of her infidelity. In secrecy, I engineered malfunctions in various household appliances. When Terry was out, I would disconnect a wire here and there, then claim that Mr. So-and-so had come to fix the appliance, charging a certain amount in cash, slightly under his usual rate. I secretly stashed this cash and would later repair the appliance myself. Through this method, I managed to squirrel away about $20,000. I also purchased tools and other items, always paying in cash, showed them to Terry, and then returned them the next day for a cash refund. I acknowledged that these actions were deceitful, but Terry's behavior had already eroded the values of honesty and trustworthiness in our relationship. The whole situation was morphing me into someone I never thought I could become, a liar. Terry's Thursday afternoon workouts with Mr. Bonte continued, and I no longer attempted to maintain any semblance of a sexual relationship with her. We simply coexisted as two housemates might. Gradually, my personal belongings started to disappear into boxes, stored in the garage, a place Terry rarely ventured into. So she didn't notice the gradual rearrangement. 
Terry rarely ventured into the garage where her car was usually parked, content to leave it as my personal space. She did once inquire about the noticeable absence of some of my items from the shelves. I managed to deflect with excuses about accidentally breaking things or no longer needing them. She seemed satisfied with these responses, primarily because most of my belongings didn't match her preferred color scheme or the desired ambience of the room. When most of my items were discreetly removed, it surprisingly did not significantly alter the house's atmosphere, making me realize how much I had conformed to Terry's tastes over the years. I took decisive steps towards independence by withdrawing as much from my superannuation as possible and purchasing a modest house on the outskirts of town. It was a small setup, just two bedrooms and a tiny yard, but it included a garage and was conveniently close to the school where I worked. The modest remaining mortgage balance was manageable on half my salary, proving that one can find excellent deals by looking beyond the allure of popular neighborhoods. This humble abode was not a grand mansion, but it represented a fresh start. As I settled into my new residence, furnishing it was straightforward with secondhand finds from thrift stores, making it feel like a collection of pre-loved items, once cherished but now revalued by necessity. My plans for separation progressed smoothly, and I found an unexpected ally in Mary Jones during a school pickup. Alone with her son Timothy, waiting for her arrival, I noticed her distressed demeanor as she approached. Mr. D, can I talk to you for a minute? She asked anxiously. Of course, just stay parked there and come over to my usual spot, I replied, referring to the benches around the school, which I jokingly called my office. She parked her car, and we sat together on the bench near the pickup area. I'm not sure how to begin what I need to tell you, she started, visibly uneasy. I'm uncertain about how much you know regarding the gym you saw me at. I responded cautiously. I know that Terry, my wife, enjoys going there, and it's been beneficial in helping her stay fit and active. She hesitated, then continued. There are things you should know about what happens there. Eager to get to the point, I asked, is it related to Philip Bonte? She responded with vehemence. You have no idea how much it involves that pig. I said, I might have an idea, but please, go ahead and tell me. Confidently, she divulged. He's a player, targeting many of the regular women there. When I inquired how she knew, she replied with tears in her eyes, I was one of them until last week. We met every Friday at 12.30. She expressed regret for being so open, saying, I'm sorry for sharing this. I genuinely enjoyed what was happening between us while it lasted. It was only when he abruptly replaced me with someone else without any explanation, just a quick sorry, no more, that I realized it was over. I had actually thought there might be a future for us. Being divorced, I missed the regular affection of a married relationship, so I was excited to experience it again with him, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Her candidness surprised me. How could she think it was appropriate to share all this with me? She must have been very upset. In an attempt to provide some comfort, I responded a bit too quickly. Marriage relationships aren't always what they seem. She studied my face, noticing the pain and anguish in my expression. You already know, don't you? She asked slowly, disbelief shaking her voice. You already know he's been involved with Terry, your wife. I admitted, yes, Mary, I knew. Thank you for sharing this. My voice struggled to hide the bitterness, but I've already set things in motion regarding the whole situation. I genuinely believe in karma, and I think it might catch up with him soon. That guy has to face the consequences. Mary raised her voice, nearly shouting, He doesn't care who he hurts or how, as long as he satisfies his sexual ego, something he can brag about to his buddies at the bar. If you want my help to get back at him, just let me know. That guy has to pay, and he should pay dearly. She called her son over and departed. I sat there, deep in thought for quite some time reflecting on everything that had been revealed and the complexities of human relationships marred by deception. When Mary shared her own experience with me, I felt a sense of relief. Initially, my thoughts of revenge seemed like just a bitter reaction to my failing marriage. But hearing from her convinced me it required more thoughtful consideration. It led me to wonder just how many other women from the gym might be involved with him. It was clearly time to gather concrete evidence. I was struck by the man's energy. But as they say, even the devil doesn't tire. He was at the gym every day except Mondays, when it was closed. Using the phone number I noted from the gym's wall and the telecom's white pages, I tracked it to an address merely three blocks from our house, 
explaining how conveniently he could visit to carry on his affairs with my soon-to-be ex-wife. I informed Terry I'd start taking daily walks around 5 o'clock p.m. A suggestion supposedly from my doctor. Terry was indifferent, likely because it didn't interfere with her liaisons, so my plan proceeded without hitches. On my first walk, I headed straight to Mr. Bonte's address. It was a ground-floor apartment in a block of similar units. His car was absent, so I waited nearby to track his movements. True to pattern, he would leave our house well before 6 o'clock p.m. and arrive at his apartment shortly before. This routine continued each day I could walk, except on staff meeting days. I began to suspect he maintained this schedule each day the gym was open and perhaps had a different rendezvous planned for each. To delve deeper, I started my walks earlier, observing his daily comings and goings and took a full week off school to dedicate to surveillance. At an electronics store, I bought the necessary equipment for my investigation, a discreet long-range listening device, not the conspicuous satellite dish type, and voice and motion-activated cameras with full-color HD capability. I purchased five cameras to ensure comprehensive coverage and an extra portable hard drive for additional storage. On Monday, I set up one of the cameras in Bonte's apartment. Given the compact size of his one-bedroom unit, which included a spacious living and kitchen dining area. One camera sufficed for most of the apartment. Installing it in his bedroom was straightforward. I waited for him to leave for the gym, then retrieved his apartment keys he'd carelessly left under the doormat. His lack of creativity with hiding his keys made my task all the easier. After setting up the camera successfully, I left the area. Now, whenever there was any movement or sound in his apartment, the camera, equipped with a microphone, would activate and live stream both video and audio directly to my computer, where it was securely stored with date stamps. The camera began its surveillance on Monday night, capturing clear footage of Bonte enjoying a takeout meal in front of his TV before retiring around 9 o'clock p.m. On Tuesday, after ensuring the gym had closed, I snuck in through a back door that is often overlooked during pre-closing checks at most facilities. Luck was on my side. I strategically placed another camera in a private room used for personal health assessments at the back of the gym, where Bonte often held sessions with private clients. As I engaged in this surreptitious activity, I began to reflect on the person I had become. I was essentially spying on others, installing cameras in private spaces, a far cry from the person I once was. I pondered the consequences of these actions. By Wednesday, I seized another opportunity when Terry left for grocery shopping. I discreetly installed the third and fourth cameras in our bedroom and living area. Reviewing the footage from Tuesday revealed both expected and unexpected behaviors. Bonte woke and left early, only to return later with breakfast. His laziness amused me. He couldn't even make his own breakfast. During his time at home, before heading to the gym at 10.30, he made a notable phone call. Julie, hi, it's Phil. Is he gone yet? Okay, see you at 12.30 at your place. Make sure to wear what I mentioned. No, I'll be careful. No one will see me enter your place. Did you say he was going for three days? All right, maybe I can come on Thursday and Friday as well. We'll talk this afternoon, lover. After the call, he left with a noticeable spring in his step, which made me wonder how he'd explain his plans to Terry. On Thursday, I set up in the garage with my computer, keen to monitor the unfolding events. Almost immediately, Bonte's camera feed appeared on my screen. He had again gone out for breakfast and returned to make another call. This time, to Terry, hey, it's Phil. How's my favorite slot feeling today? Phil, don't talk like that on the phone. You never know who could be listening. Luckily, my husband has gone to work. See you at 12.30 as usual. The final update involved Mary, the parent from school, who seemed eager to assist in any way she could. I asked her to compile a list of women that Bonte had been involved with. She tackled this task with enthusiasm and quickly provided names and addresses. To my shock and dismay, Terry's name was on that list. At this point, I had nearly severed all emotional ties to our house, which had transformed from a home into just another structure. Terry was content with my explanation that I was meticulously decluttering my belongings as it freed up more space for her and did not impact her possessions. I had already relocated the garage items to my new home, completing my gradual exit. All I needed was a brief 20-minute window to collect my last few items and drive away in my car. I had consulted with a divorce attorney 
ensuring that all necessary divorce paperwork was prepared and ready to be served promptly. The financial details had been settled. Our savings for a vacation were fully depleted, with the funds securely transferred to my personal account. I meticulously kept all receipts for fictitious purchases organized in a folder, prepared to present them as evidence if required. I updated the beneficiaries of my superannuation fund to our children and withdrew any accessible funds. I also set up separate bank accounts, credit cards, and insurance policies solely in my name. Additionally, I transferred the car, its registration, and insurance solely to Terry, making her entirely responsible for it moving forward. Regarding the house, I had to leave its fate to the decisions of the courts. I acquired a new mobile phone registered only under my name and ensured it had an unlisted number, deactivating the old one. I prepared a package of information for each husband or partner of the women, listed by Mary, detailing when and where their partners had been involved with the gym instructor. These packages included his name and address, and I also provided the address of the sexual health clinic in our town, as most of these encounters appeared to be unprotected. I sent a detailed letter to the owner of the gym, suggesting it was time for a serious discussion with their head instructor. On our kitchen table, I left the divorce papers, printed photos from the video surveillance, and DVDs of Terry's encounters with the instructor. Alongside this bundle, I placed my wedding ring, cut in half and covered in unpleasant substances. The accompanying note read, Terry, I left you this damaged ring, covered with the same mess that symbolizes what happened to our marriage. Please refrain from contacting me unless it's through the attorney mentioned in the divorce papers. I've requested the school to prohibit your access to the premises, so please avoid trying to reach me there, as disturbances can lead to swift police intervention. I've also informed our children about my actions to ensure there is no confusion about why this breakup occurred. Copies of the DVDs have been sent to them to prevent any false narratives about who initiated this separation. I settled into my new home, bracing myself for the repercussions of my actions, which unfolded with dramatic intensity. The local news soon erupted with the scandal of a nearby gym, forcing its closure and the owner to flee the town. Meanwhile, a notorious gym instructor was found beaten in a downtown alley, supposedly assaulted by an unidentified group of men. This turmoil led to a wave of divorce filings and numerous homes hitting the market. On the day Terry discovered the divorce papers and the other items I had left, she fainted from shock. Our elderly neighbor, who heard her scream and saw her collapse, quickly called for emergency services and left the door open as she awaited their arrival. Terry tried desperately to contact me but to no avail, and her attempt to approach me at the school led to her arrest and a night in jail, followed by a stern reprimand from the magistrate. Our children openly expressed their disappointment in Terry's actions. Fortunately, both were already married and shared my ethical views on fidelity, a trait they did not inherit from Terry. The divorce was finalized swiftly, and the financial settlements followed standard procedures. Terry was forced to sell our house, and the proceeds enabled her to buy a smaller property in the outer suburbs, where she now lives alone. The stigma of her actions at the gym followed her. She often encountered whispering and sidelong glances whenever she ventured into town, which led to her spiraling into depression and eventually requiring care in a mental health facility. As for myself, I continued my teaching career, living peacefully in my new home, content with the simplicity and integrity of my life, far removed from the chaos that had once threatened my peace.